This evening we're going to be looking at introductory words, but just to, just to go and say a few things concerning the written word. God chose to use the written word to teach mankind. He chose that for it to go through the entire length of human history. Well, going from Moses all the way to the end of time. Now, God could have chose any number of ways to do it, but He chose this way, and it's the one that makes the most sense, actually. He could have, if He wanted to, He could have had prophets at every single point in history, and their job would be to relay everything that God has given us to mankind, and they would just tell it to us, and we could just hear it. He could have done it that way. He could have had it to where everything is to, such as uh, something is given to Moses, but Moses just relates it to those around him, Joshua, and then Joshua just would relate it, it would all be verbal or all be oral, and that would be related to the next generation, and they would memorize it and then relate it to the next generation. But neither of those ways works too well. One is that, that, that first one is just a continuation of making more and more profits. And here's the thing. You can hear something and then not really remember all that was said and exactly the way it was said. And that goes with the, having some sort of oral tradition as well of where while Moses may have given it to someone like Joshua and given it to him just verbally, not putting it down, and Joshua may have been able to have done that successfully to the next generation, but it would not take long till things get very, very corrupted and what we would have today would not be verifiable at all. But God has given us His written word and when it is put down, it's like what Jesus says there in Matthew chapter 4, it is written. When he says that, he is saying it's written and it's set. And he's also saying, he's applying it to himself. He's saying because it is written that he's under that law as well. He's under it. Man shall not live by bread alone is, is what he, he quotes there, but every word that proceeds from the word, from the mouth of God. Okay. So in that, Jesus says it's been written, it's been set, and it has meaning. It still means something. And matter of fact, it means exactly what it meant the moment it was written down. It means the exact thing. No difference whatsoever. And that, actually, what he says, man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, that's, that's a principle that goes all the way from Genesis with the garden to the final day, whenever that is. That that is what we are to do, live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, this evening, we're going to be looking at really the introduction of individuals in the Bible, because as we have made note, uh, we've been, we were looking at first words, and such as a, a uh, a couple of weeks ago with the first words that are recorded uh, Christ that, uh, of a direct quote of Christ in each of the Gospels. And making note of, of the first quote that is chosen there by the Holy Spirit to put in that particular narrative, whether it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Now, last week we did introductory, or rather, first words of some of the apostles, not all, but some of them, and to show how their character is being shown there by what was chosen as first for them to say, first for them to be, to be quoted. Now, this evening, we're going to look at that of introductions, of how the Bible introduces certain individuals. And these are going to be some, we, we could call them major people that are found in the Bible. But I want us to make note of some things. There is a very popular thought, and it is a utter misunderstanding, that somehow all the righteous people 
in the Bible are displayed as absolute perfection, that they are displayed with halos around their heads and that they are the most pious and the most holy and just impossible people to, to imitate. And that's a notion that comes through the Renaissance and through Roman Catholicism and through popular notions. And the Bible does not relay its historical people. It does not relate the people that it talks about in such a fashion. There is only one person that is without sin, and that is Christ. That's it. The rest are shown with flaws and all. It, whether you want to talk about Noah? We can show you a flaw concerning Noah. Abraham? We can show you a flaw concerning Abraham. You want to, uh, Peter? Show you plenty of flaws with, with Peter. Uh, and others, others that you, and there's so many misconceptions by people who simply, they hear it and they repeat it. They believe it and they don't even look for themselves. And the, the, the people who are fooling them, the people who are saying these things to, to other people, no, they're not going to check up on it. But it's the easiest thing in the world to do it. It's the easiest thing in the world to just look and find out. Look and find out. I don't know how many times, and, and we will get to this lesson in a second, I don't know how many times I've talked about things such as creation and the person I'm having a discussion with or and a de little debate with, they have the foggiest idea of creation. They have no idea. Nothing. Or concerning the flood, and they have no idea, so the, the ark isn't big enough. Okay, how big was the ark? They don't know. You're going to argue that the ark isn't big enough, but you have no idea how big the ark was. Or that Noah could not have gone all around the world gathering up all these animals. Have you read Genesis 6 ever? Or that they uh, couldn't, all these animals could not make their way to Palestine. Okay. Are you sure the ark started there? Are you sure that's the case? Because it doesn't say that. Now, let's look at how certain individuals are, in fact, introduced. We will start with David, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, and we will begin in verse 11. And uh, Samuel is told by God that he is to anoint the next king. Now, the current king is still in place. Saul is still very much king, and he's going to be king for quite a number of years. He's going to be king for 40 years. Okay? And so, but God has grown weary with Saul because Saul is not the king that he should have been. He is not regarding the word of God as being important at all, important enough to obey. He's not. He thinks he is. He thinks he is, but he, it's not important enough for him to take to the absolute letter, which he's supposed to do. Now, we go to 1 Samuel 16 in verse 11. Then Samuel said to Jesse, because he's gone through all the present sons of Jesse, one of them is going to be king, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes, and good-looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. All right. David is, is the youngest son of Jesse. How is he described here? Because one can say, well, yeah, he's the, the most treasured king of Israel. And look how flattering, flatteringly, he's being presented here. Well, he's, he's just a boy. He's a boy. 
And the fact is, that's actually what's being stressed here, is that he's pretty young, and that one would not have cast their eyes on all the sons of Jesse and said, oh, well, it's, it's obviously him. They would. Matter of fact, Samuel, who is a prophet, didn't know that the first one wasn't the king. The oldest one wasn't the king. Well, it's not him, and it's not him, and it's not him, and it's not him going down the road. And then, all right, who else is there? Well, there's the youngest. I guess, I guess we're going to have to see about him. And so here he is, the youngest son of Jesse. He's keeping his sheep. So he's not present when Samuel arrives. He's called ruddy. All right, what does that even mean? That means he's healthy looking. He has uh, that uh, reddish complexion to him of being very healthy. He's been outdoors, very healthy, uh, healthy reddish color of skin. Uh, he has bright eyes, good looking, and then we see the Spirit of the Lord came upon him once he is anointed. Now, concerning David, David does have an extraordinary reputation and an extraordinary behavior. And in what I refer to as, well, first off, that of being the, the king in waiting, but then becoming king, he still is extraordinary until he makes his big mistake. And it's a mistake that's not just between him and Bathsheba. It just, just affects them. It affects... He's king. The things that he does may very well affect an entire nation, and it did. It may very well affect his entire family, and it did. And with kings, kings have a greater impact on those that they are uh, over than those under the king have a greater impact on the nation. And is he seen as being perfect? No, he's not. He is guilty of adultery, of lying, and of murder. And that's not just murder of Uriah the Hittite. It's those that had to die so that Uriah's death would look like an act of battle. But he murdered Uriah. And all of those people died because of David. Now, let's just back up just a little bit to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. And here we have the first king that is being introduced. And this, of course, is Saul. So Samuel chapter 9, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. There was, and we began with the, the father, that's uh, Saul is the son of Kish. There was a man of Benjamin, whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of uh, Becherath, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. So this describes the father of Saul. And this puts him in, uh, in line to Benjamin. So he's of the tribe of Benjamin. So which means Saul, his son's going to be of the tribe of Benjamin. Verse 2, and he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. Look at this. Okay. Choice, handsome. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Then we begin concerning the events of him being anointed, and he's looking for lost donkeys. Is what he's, that's where we find him. That's what he's doing. Now, he is, because we can look at the description of, of David, uh, that of ruddy and bright eyes and good looking. But you look at this, and there's not uh, anyone more handsome than he is among the children of Israel. And he is, he's a tall man. All right, that, that also is flattering. Well, he's a king of Israel. Well, there's a reason why he is described this way. One, it's the truth. It's the truth. Number two is also, what were the people looking for? When they went to Samuel, what did they want? They're going to complain about Samuel's sons, and there, was thing, there were things to complain concerning Samuel's sons. 
They're abusing their position. They are priests, Samuel's high priest. They're abusing their positions, very much like uh, Hophni and Phinehas had done a generation earlier. They are similar in that respect. Okay, how do we solve this problem? Well, what they say is we need a king like the nations. That doesn't even address the issue. That, that one does not follow the other logically. It doesn't follow the other. This, what they were after was a king like the nations. That's what they wanted. And that's what they're going to get. A king like the nations. Well, what was it? Why would they even want a king? Because they had the most perfect sort of, of government they could have, which was a theocracy. God was their king king and God gave them warnings if you give a king get a king if if you're going to have a king these are the things the king is going to do that you don't have to put up with at this moment you don't have to put up with it he's going to take your sons into an army he's going to take your daughters to serve him in these various capacities and and all these things he's going to to tax you like you've never been taxed before because he's got to have a standing army and he's got to have palaces he's got to have all these things and God gave them a warning that if this is what you want this is what you're going to get this is what's going to happen and they want a man who's going to be impressive because that's what they see with the Gentile nations. They see impressive men on horses or in palaces or on thrones. They see that and they want that as well. Well, they had a far better situation than those Gentile nations did because you have kings in there that are just out and out thugs. That's what they are. Some of them, not, not all of them, but some of them. And they are asking to have someone over them that in time is going to corrupt them. In time. We get to a point of Solomon at the end of his life. And things are going pretty bad. And then get to Jeroboam and Rehoboam and the splitting of the kingdom. And Jeroboam was never good. Jeroboam just took that northern kingdom immediately away from God's Word. Keeping a semblance of it, the feel of it, but it's not. Now, with Saul, Saul, this choice, this handsome son, no one more handsome than he is, and he's taller than anybody else, he looks the part. He would look good in robes. He'd look good leading an army on horseback. He would look the part. And for a brief moment, Saul was okay. And there are certain things about Saul that, that are okay. There are certain things. He is willing to defend Israel. He's willing to defend Israel. He does do that. He does go into war. He's willing to do that. And that's, that's a positive for him. And when Paul, Paul when David writes the song of the bow, how the mighty have fallen. He's giving respect to his dead king. He's giving respect, even though that man became a madman wanting him, David, dead. Now, we see from this how David is portrayed at the beginning and how Saul is portrayed in the beginning, and how they turn out to be very, very different men. But what is in all of it is the truth of the matter. It's all the truth. These are not fairy tales, nor are they some sort of, of moral tales that did, weren't, are not true, but you can gain something out of them. This, these are historic facts. And yes, we gain from them, learning by way of examples, but understanding that these men were very real. They lived on this earth, and this is the way they were. Now, let's go to Acts, to the book of Acts, and we're going to look at two, two uh, men. 
And we'll go to Acts chapter 4 to begin with. And uh, we're going to have one that it would seem, we'll just use that word again, it would seem like very flattering. And then the next one's going to be very unflattering. And it is the truth that's being given in all of this. So we go, we begin in, in Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 36. And Joseph, who is also named Barnabas, by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, there are others doing this. There are others who were, uh, we just look at verse uh, 34. Now, uh, nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold. There were others doing this. But it singles out Barnabas because his was the best. No, that's not why he is singled out to be named. He is named because he's being introduced, because he's going to come back in in chapter 9, helping Paul there in Jerusalem. And he's also going to be one, he's truly the son of encouragement of where he goes to look for Saul who has gone off to Tarsus, back off to Tarsus. He goes looking for Saul to take him to Antioch to help in that congregation. And the two of them are going on the first missionary journey together. He's from Cyprus. Uh, Paul is from Tarsus of Cilicia. They both have... Uh, a background in the Gentile world. They are Jewish men, but they both have a background in the Gentile world. And so they would be able to travel around with a greater, well, less fear and an understanding of Gentile ways than someone like a Peter or a John would be able to do. They, would, they could get around much better. And Peter and John, they had other duties that they had that God wanted them to do. But here, he, his given name is Joseph. That's his given name. But they don't refer to him as Joseph. And never in the book of Acts, again, does it refer to him as Joseph. He's Barnabas because he's earned that name. I really don't know what Joseph, if that's a, a form of Joseph, I think that it is. But Barnabas being son of encouragement, meaning he was a very encouraging person, and that was obvious. And he does behave like that through all the text, through the text, except where he is taken by the hypocrisy there in, in Galatians chapter 2. And Paul speaks of that, that even Barnabas is taken by uh, the uh, hypocrisy that's, that's going on there. And when Paul says that, He's saying that he can't believe Barnabas was, was also uh, followed. And, well, let's just, I'm talking about it and everyone's going to wonder. Um, all right, let's go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James. He would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. So Peter, at a certain point, he was in full fellowship with everybody, fully with everybody, Jew and Gentile, in that congregation. It did not matter. But you have these certain men who came from James, and things change. There's a bit of a pressure, social pressure that comes in with these men. And he, Peter, separates himself now from the Gentiles and would not have anything to do with them. All right, as we have explained before, that does wonders for the unity of a congregation. That does wonders for it. Paul doesn't have anything to do with this. Verse 13, look at what he says. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. And him saying even Barnabas is like, it would be saying, I can't believe Barnabas also did it. That 
above them all, I think that he would have trusted Barnabas not to have done this. Of them all, he would have chosen Barnabas as never doing this at all. But he is. He's taken away by the hypocrisy. Now, he does address this. Verse 14, But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? So what does that mean? That means that he had lived... Before all these men came, he had lived like a Gentile. What does that mean? He was there in full fellowship with the Gentiles, had no problem being with them because he knew, he knew from Acts chapter 10 that the Gentiles were accepted. He knew that. He very well knew that. But here come these men up, and all of a sudden, he's going to put that, that barrier back down, that veil back down. He's going to put that wall there of where there is a strict difference between Jew and Gentile. But under Christ, that's taken away. Under Christ, that is no more. And so he's returned back to living as the Jews, and is he compelling the Gentiles now to live as Jews? So it would seem. Because he's not going to have anything to do with them unless they're Jewish. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And here we see a major figure in the book of Acts and also the New Testament. He is known here as Saul. And this is how he's introduced. And he's not introduced flatteringly at all because there was nothing about him necessarily that, was, that would bring about uh, any kind of good remark. It was the, the things that he was doing. So we begin in verse 58, Acts chapter 7, verse 58, And they cast him out of the city, that's Stephen, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. All right, now, out of all the people that are involved in this particular stoning, we only get two names. We get the name of the one who's being killed. His name is Stephen. But what about all the others who were involved in this who kill Stephen? We don't get their names at all. But there's one who is there who doesn't pick up the first stone. He doesn't do any act, no, nothing active to kill Stephen, but he does consent to his death, and that is Saul. Why do we care about this young man named Saul? Because once again, Acts, the book of Acts, is introducing someone before we get to the main subject of this person and their line, their timeline. We're being introduced to him. So now let's just go to uh, we're chapter 8 and verse 1. Now Saul was consenting, consenting to his death. That's Stephen's. At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Now Saul of Tarsus is part of that. He is part of this great persecution. So he does more than just has the, the clothes at, at his feet, as uh, this would be the outer garments, the cloaks, the outer garments of those who are stoning Stephen. He does more than that. He does a lot more than that. Verse 2, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul... He made havoc of the church. There's nothing flattering about that. He made a havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So this great persecution, Saul is part of that machine doing the persecuting. He is doing this. Now, this is how we're introduced to Him. One, because it's the truth. And number two in all this is that God can use anybody. I will admit, 
If I had lived in the first century and had been among the Christians there in Jerusalem, I wouldn't have looked at Saul of Tarsus and said, you know, he'd make a very good apostle to the Gentiles. Wouldn't have said it. Nobody would have said it. Nobody would have seen him and said, you know, he could do a great deal for the church. But God saw something. God saw something in this man that no one else could have possibly understood or known because he sees us for who we are. I remember having my mom years ago, I was a child, saying, I know you better than you do. And I was wondering, oh, really? <laughs> Uh, how is that? How is that even possible? But okay, because she knew what I was likely to do, and that there were certain things that would come around, and she knew that yeah, if you see this, this is what you're going to do, and so so she knew very well what I was very likely to do, and so she gave me warnings. Well, God knows more about us than we know about ourselves. He knows more about us. He knew what Saul was going to do, wanting Saul to be a good king, wanting, but knowing the man that was the soul, the, the will, the mind, the heart of that man. Same thing with David, same thing with Barnabas, same thing with Saul of Tarsus. Now, Let's just compare two Sauls here. Saul the king, he's described as handsome. He's described in just very nice ways, but it's all physical. Every, every bit of it is, is physical. And he would look like, yeah, he's going to be a glorious king. He would be fantastic. You couldn't make a better choice as far as appearances are concerned. He looks like it. But you get to Saul of Tarsus and you see what he's doing. No one would have said, yes, he would make a good apostle. He would make a good one. No one would have said that. Uh, and he is, uh, no one would appear to be more zealously against Jesus of Nazareth and the sect of the Nazarenes, as Tertullus said, uh, calls it in his little speech, that he's, he's, not, he's not someone that is offered very flatteringly, introduced this way, but just truthfully, that's it, just truthfully. And what else can we expect the Bible to be but truthful in all ways and with all of these, we follow their history to see where it led. With Saul of Benjamin, son of Kish, it's to him becoming a madman and he eventually committing suicide. With David, it's him becoming king, patiently waiting for that to occur and becomes an extremely good king. Yes, makes a major mistake. Those are sins and God would have killed him. Because Nathan says it, God would have killed him if he had not repented. But he does. And he is called a man after God's own heart. So he turns, he turns himself around. With Barnabas, Barnabas, he's, he is uh, going to be that son of encouragement, but even he too is carried away by hypocrisy. Everyone has their problems and their mistakes. Everybody does. And with Saul, he starts off looking rather wicked, but becomes, I think that's one of the reasons why Saul becomes so much of a worker, so much of one who is always active, is because of his background. Because you think that he would forget those faces of the men and women he hauled off to prison and seeing someone. You think he forgot the face of Stephen? No way. No way. 
did he? And that he saw that as, I believe that was one enormous motivator to where he tried to, as, as all that he had to help build the church and sow the seed because he had actively tried to tear it apart. This evening, now I realize this is not evangelistic. This evening is just a matter of looking at the text and how the text presents major individuals, how it introduces them. And all of them are put down, as we said, for us to learn. Good examples, bad examples. Avoid the bad, imitate the good. And with all of them, we can see where where certain mistakes were made, these are the consequences that occurred. And that isn't given just as sort of uh, things that, that could never be repeated per se of someone who makes these mistakes, there will be consequences to it. To this very day, there will be consequences. Because, and, and all of that makes it very pertinent and very important for us to know. We need to look at our lives, make the adjustments that need to be done next. Make, become uh, more diligent, become, uh, use, uh, develop new talents, do something greater, become a greater servant for our Lord. Take what we've got and use it. Use it for the reason in which it was given. This evening, if you need to respond to the invitation, if you... Uh, If we can help you in any way, we ask that you come as we stand and sing.